Hello everybody, glad to see us on your channel. Today we'll listen to the fourth part of the memoirs of German Kohl. Steidel Luitpold, regimental commander of Paulus' Sixth Army. First conversations in captivity with Soviet officers. A few hours after the column started moving, the generals and we senior officers were separated from the soldiers and taken in open trucks to a small, almost undestroyed village. Here we drank hot tea, washed our faces, put on fresh Russian soldiers' shirts and somewhat tidied ourselves up. Then the barber cut our hair bare. This was necessary because we had not washed for a long time and were lousy. Although we looked unusual, we felt better. I happened to be in the neighbourhood when Soviet photographers were taking pictures of Schlomer and Daniels. By the way, this picture in April 1943 appeared in one of the Swiss newspapers. Schlomer, who in one of the last battles was quite seriously wounded by a shell fragment during the shooting leaned on a stick and took General Daniels under his arm. Then we were all together in a large room of one of the wooden houses. Three or four Soviet officers stood before us, among them the lieutenant colonel with whom we had been negotiating. They probably wanted to do something nice for us and offered us cookies and vodka, which to our empty stomachs obviously posed some danger. We treated ourselves. Then the first conversation began, which was conducted in an atmosphere that did not require formal restraint. Somehow it became easy to talk at once. Daniels raised his glass and thanked the Soviet officers, doctors, petty officers and soldiers for their selfless actions. It sounded almost like the final word in summarising the results of manoeuvres after a successful peaceful battle and assessment is made, successes are noted, and hands are shaken. It even seemed a bit inappropriate to me. But Daniels could not be blamed for this, he had always been prone to excitability, especially if a good sip of alcohol helped him forget conventions. The lieutenant colonel, who carefully observed our very different reactions, must have been a good man one of his first questions, which was also a wish, was about the fate of our wives and children back home, they would probably have been very happy to hear that we were alive and well. I was extremely touched, hesitated for a moment, and then went up to him, and not thinking long, took off my binoculars and gave them to him as a token of my gratitude, and as a memento of that hour. We were then taken to another house, which was not far away. On three sides of a not-too-large room were tables where Soviet officers were sitting. Judging by their epaulets up to now, we had not been particularly interested in the insignia of the Red Army they were senior officers and generals. Directly behind them on two sides of the room were more tables and chairs there two sat officers and a few men in civilian clothes. Thus there was comparatively little space left for us, the arena, so to speak. The atmosphere was tense, unless someone whispered something to a neighbour. If I am not mistaken, next to me were Generals Daniels, Schlomer, Colonel Schwartz, Weber Boy Kur, Lieutenant Colonel Wernerberg, and a few others. One of the senior Soviet officers briefly said that the Soviet side would like to know more about the background of our decision to surrender. Because it is known with what persistence fought formations and units of the Sixth Army. At the same time, it was also about the Soviet command's proposal of January 8th to surrender. Why didn't we decide to take this step, even then it was possible to avoid bloodshed in vain? Someone began to answer, I don't remember now whether it was Schlomer or Schwartz. At any rate, I did not share what they said. The Russians might have had a perception that did not correspond at all to what our soldiers and junior officers felt in reality, nor to what was thought by those who had to pay with their lives, because the command did not want to assess the situation correctly. I could not resist and briefly express my opinion, which differed from that of the generals, but which, in my opinion, corresponded to the truth. But I realised that my opinion only partially corresponded to the reality much later, after long reflection, rethinking and overcoming the past. In any case, already in the first conversation with Soviet officers, the differences in our ranks became clear, which until then had been hidden behind the habit of responding to everything with the usual, yes, I obey. None of us could get rid of this habit at that time. After I had expressed my dissenting opinion at that first meeting, 
I felt that my behaviour was regarded as uncomradeship, as an attempt to explode the unity that had to be strengthened in captivity. Spiritual autonomy, one's own thoughts and conclusions, all this, of course, was recognised, but at the same time it was considered that no divergence of opinion should be allowed in the presence of the Soviets on the contrary. Even in captivity it was necessary to maintain cohesion and discipline. The dialogue we had at this first big talk continued to have its effect on us for a long time. What the Soviet officers said was convincing and showed that they were trying to understand our way of thinking. Our interlocutors were highly educated and, contrary to the idea of communist robots that had been drummed into our heads, displayed a diversity of personalities and positive personal qualities. All this allowed us to take the lesson taught to us favourably. After all, we had been processed, and not only since 1933, by anti-communist propaganda. We were victims of this processing. That is why our situation after the surrender frightened us, seemed dangerous and almost unbearable. As night fell, we were placed in open trucks and overtaking kilometre-long columns of prisoners drove for about an hour and a half. All around, Russian soldiers were burning fires, lights could be seen in some houses and ruins were glimpsed. We turned off the highway onto a narrow road, drove another half a kilometre, then followed the command to unload and, treading heavily one after another, we went straight to a group of ruined houses. The first night we spent in a long barn, completely burned out, standing or sitting along the half-collapsed walls. The Soviet guards allowed us to bring in broken doors and crates, and soon a fire blazed in the middle of the shed. Tongues of flame burst out into the clear starry sky, and for the first time in many days we were properly warmed. After two hours the fire died out, only the middle of the fire remained hot. We lay down on the stone slabs, pressed closely together, so that no one had to stand. In spite of our fatigue, there was no real sleep we were kept awake by agonising and restless thoughts. We listened to the darkness, no shooting was heard at all, even if there was still fighting in some parts of this incredibly large city on the Volga. This shooting was drowned out by the hum and noise of the cars that were constantly passing nearby. By morning it had become quite cold in the barn. From three o'clock in the morning we began to rise little by little, and in order to warm up somehow, some of us stomped our feet, others waved their hands and rubbed them, others patted and pushed each other. At six o'clock we moved on. Again the path went through snow-covered fields. Beyond the ruins of this village we saw our soldiers, who had spent the night in the open air and were already organised in more or less slender columns. I found the remnants of my regiment, as well as the anti-aircraft gunners, railroad workers and soldiers of one field post, who were part of Steidel's battle group. We were allowed to use a short time to say goodbye to the soldiers, explaining that from here our paths would part. We already knew that according to the PR regulations, officers and soldiers could be housed together only on special occasions. And here an exciting parting took place. Here we met also the officers who had earlier sought us out and found their way into captivity. Still the number of those who surrendered with us was much greater than we had supposed. Six or eight thousand were spoken of. Many wanted only to find out why the fighting had suddenly stopped and as a result were forced to join those who were going into captivity. The 6th Army Headquarters and the Southern Cauldron under Colonel General Getz capitulated on January 31st. General Strecker, unfortunately, remained incorrigible to the end and continued pointless resistance in the Northern Cauldron until February 2nd. That's when the Stalingrad hell ceased to exist. The March of Shame and Guilt a group of officers, augmented by a few soldiers and non-commissioned officers, was formed into a column of eight men. There was a march ahead that required us to exert all our strength. We took each other under the arms. We tried to hold the pace of the march, but for those who marched at the end of the column, it was still too fast. Calls and requests to go slower did not stop, and it was all the more understandable because we took with us many with sore legs and they could hardly move on the well-travelled, shining like a mirror, icy road. What did I as a soldier not see on those marches? Endless rows of houses, 
and in front of them even at small huts lovingly tended vegetable gardens and orchards, and behind them playing children, for whom everything that was happening had either become commonplace or remained incomprehensible. And then the endless fields stretched on and on, interspersed with forest belts and steep or gentle hills. In the distance, the outlines of industrial plants peeped through. For hours we marched or rode along railroads and canals. All manner of crossings were tried, even to the point of using the mountain road at dizzying heights. And then again we marched past the smoking ruins into which the settlements that had existed for centuries had been turned. In Flanders we forded canals and harbour reservoirs, where the stagnant water reeked disgustingly of filth, carrion and rot, for the conduits were clogged everywhere. Floating on top was oil, and whatever had been brought in by the current from barns, houses and ruined businesses. There were animal corpses, crates of rotten fruit, household utensils, logs. In Russia we passed by typical and small Russian houses, few of them surviving, past endless rows of ruins, from which still protruded sturdily built Russian stoves, and among the ruins lay the remains of mangled iron beds, a living testimony to our incredible barbarism. Often one could see strange figures, wrapped in black, scurrying along the roads, trying to save something. We saw people wandering aimlessly back and forth in deep despair. Everywhere gloomy eyes glared at us, hurling curses silent but with deep reproach. It took our breath away, for those glaring eyes squeezed our throats and penetrated our hearts. Hardly anyone will forget it. On both sides of our path stretched snow-covered fields. At least it seemed so to us on that January morning, when the frosty air mixed with the descending fog and the land seemed to be lost in infinity. Only from time to time could we see the prisoners of war huddled together, who, like us, were making that march the march of guilt and shame. They under the weight of the experience. After about two hours we reached a large group of buildings at the entrance to Bikitovka. This was probably a school or institute closed for the duration of the war. We were housed there in every room, from basement to attic, mostly in groups of eight, ten or fifteen. Those who did not grab a place at first had to stand or sit on the landing as they pleased. But this building had windows, a roof, water, and a temporary kitchen. Opposite the main building were the restrooms. In the next building was a sanitary unit with Soviet doctors and nurses. We were allowed to walk around the large courtyard at any time of the day, to meet and talk to each other. In order to avoid typhus, cholera, plague and anything else that could arise in such crowded conditions, a widespread campaign of protective inoculations was organised. For many, however, this proved to be a latecomer. Epidemics and serious illnesses were still prevalent in Stalingrad. Those who fell ill died alone or among comrades. Wherever they had to, in an overcrowded basement hastily equipped as an infirmary, in some corner, in a snowy trench. No one asked about the cause of the other's death. The overcoat, scarf and jacket of the dead were not lost the living needed them. Many people got infected through them. And here, in Bikitovka, manifested what we thought absolutely impossible, but what made extremely clear and the criminal nature of Hitler's actions, and our own guilt that we did not fulfil a long, ripened decision physical, mental and spiritual collapse on an unprecedented scale. Many who managed to get out of the Stalingrad scourge could not stand it and died of typhus, dysentery or complete exhaustion of physical and mental strength. Anyone who was alive a few minutes ago could suddenly collapse on the floor and in a quarter of an hour find himself among the dead. Any step for many could be fatal. A step into the yard, from which you will never return. A step for water, which you will never drink again. A step with a loaf of bread under your arm which you will never eat again. Suddenly the heart stopped working. Soviet women doctors and nurses often sacrificing themselves and not knowing peace fought against mortality. They saved many and helped everyone. And yet it took more than one week before the epidemics could be halted. Gradually the daily routine began to take shape. The cold weather intensified. In spite of this we were eager to get outside 
standing leaning against the wall where the sun's rays fell on us at noon. We stepped from foot to foot to warm ourselves, listened to conversations, exchanged rumours, waited for bread or porridge. We watched indifferently as the dead were carried out of the buildings to where many were already lying. Stalingrad devastated us physically, mentally and spiritually. It became increasingly difficult to fight apathy and indifference to life. The lethargy paralysing everything intensified. The fear psychosis generated by fascist propaganda revived with renewed vigour and became a good breeding ground for the wildest rumours. Therefore we were happy to have any interlocutor, any topic of conversation. We exchanged thoughts about the attitude of the Soviet people toward us at the first meeting after the surrender and here in Bukitovka. The Soviet commanding authorities put a lot of effort into registering all the prisoners, interviewing them, vaccinating them naturally. All this was done to constantly improve the organisation of life in our camp. We were struck by how many women worked as military doctors, orderlies, and also as officers of the Soviet army. Everything went on in a businesslike manner, without haste and with undisguised interest in the German officers from near Stalingrad. The questions that young women in uniform asked us when filling out questionnaires often puzzled us greatly. These questions had nothing to do with military matters. They were usually about home, family, profession, and often also with delicate curiosity about what we thought, what we were most concerned about now. Yes, that's what Soviet women are like doctors and orderlies. But that's here, in quarantine. But they won't keep us here for long. Where will we go? And what awaits us? Again, the unknown troubled me. I thought about everything that had happened through the fault of the Germans and about what now these Germans, that is us, might be waiting for. We had never had so much time for reflection. We Weber, Kuh, Werneberg, and all the surviving officers of my regiment agreed to meet at the wall in closing the camp, where the sun's rays warmed the longest. Each in his own way tried to help to make the hours, days and nights of waiting not too heavy, so that each could be relieved of the moral burden which his comrade helped him to carry. Episodes from everyday family life and work, the minutiae of provincial town life, gossip, stories of adventures with women, all these distracted us from sad reflections and helped us to hold on to life firmly. Do you still remember when I can't list the conversations that began with those exact words? In addition, we were fond of piecing together this, or that phase of the battle of a critical situation, when for some time no one knows how the battle will end. Interestingly, it was at this point that arguments flared up, nerves were strained, and the mind completely forgot that this eternal flesh and blood change of giving orders and obedience had suddenly lost all meaning for us. Colonel Bernate walked back and forth as usual, his hands in the pockets of his overcoat, his collar turned up, with an expression that could hide everything irony, indifference to the course of events, and cold calculation. Colonel Schwartz, as always, remained good-natured Colonel Kurt was withdrawn, taciturn Wernerberg was businesslike and resourceful, optimistically weighing the pros and cons. Streng, despite his high fever, was always with us, against the advice of the doctors. His face was scarlet red, his eyes feverish. He could hardly control himself, for he firmly believed in returning to his homeland, and therefore hoped to overcome his debilitating illness. He had to go to the infirmary. After that I never saw him again. Toward evening a thick fog fell. It was unusually quiet. This almost oppressive silence was occasionally interrupted by the rumble of airplanes and distant gun thunder, but soon it all subsided. Probably the Stalingrad cauldron was finally over. The next morning, February 4th, it was officially announced to us by a Soviet major. He made a great impression on us, not only by the way he stood in front of all of us in several rows, not only by the fact that he wore an impeccable uniform, an amazingly white dungaree and fur hat, but mainly by his calm, accommodating manner. We did not understand much of what he said in Russian, we remembered only a few names Stalingrad, Zhukov, Chukov, and a few more unknown names that we could not memorize. 
Later, Captain Waldemani explained to us that the Soviet officer praised the exploits of ordinary soldiers in the last phase of the fighting. This particularly struck us. Much later we became accustomed to the fact that there was almost no Soviet command report on major combat operations, which quite differently from ours did not point out the excellent actions on the front line of sergeants, petty officers and soldiers. The way to the north. A week or a week and a half later we suddenly received orders to prepare for a march. Our way lay through Bikitovka. It must have been a village, but it looked more like a vast settlement spread over many kilometres. This comparatively not very destroyed village was filled with Red Army units and, most surprisingly of all, with local residents the front had by that time advanced to the west for several hundred kilometres. We lined up on the almost empty tracks in front of an infinitely long train of a passenger train. The railroad track in the Soviet Union is wider than in Germany. The cars seemed huge to us, simply gigantic. Soon we were sitting in a clean third-class car, eight people in each compartment. The only Soviet people we met were the sentries at paired posts at the beginning and end of each car Ukrainians, Caucasians, Belarusians and maybe even natives of Tashkent. All of them spoke to each other in pure Russian, as explained to us by Boy, who by that time had been transferred to us with other colonels. It was reported that many generals were also travelling with us. No one managed to find out where we were going. It got dark very early. Under the steady clatter of wheels, immersed in thoughts and dreams, we fell asleep. The train stopped often, but always in a place where it was impossible either to read the name of the station or to make conversation with anyone on the other side of the car, it was forbidden to open the windows during the stop. Women brought bread, tea, food and even butter to the compartments. If our families knew what conditions we were in. On the third day, rumours spread on the train that we would soon arrive in Moscow. In any case, the general direction of our journey had long since become clear north-northwest. We stared out of the windows for hours. We glimpsed small and large villages, peacefully resting in the endless distance among the snow drifts and in the fields huge stacks, often much higher than the low houses. And then we drove through Moscow. Although it was night, we still managed to get a first, still vague idea of the size of this world city, whose ghostly outlines glided past us in the deep darkness. At Krasnogorsk. The train stopped behind a station between numerous railroad tracks. When dawn broke, we passed in marching order through the settlement, which seemed to live its ordinary life. Exactly in peacetime, we stopped at the camp gate. The wooden fence, like many other things inside, was painted blue. It was Krasnogorsk. We were housed in barracks. I was lucky together with eight comrades I found myself in a large room that had previously served as a shoemaker's workshop. It was spacious. We could look out through wide windows onto the camp yard. The room was sunny. The daily routine was strictly regulated. Particular attention was paid to personal hygiene, i.e. the fight against lice every time disinfestation and then a shower. Between disinfections we used to scrape knits out of woolen jackets tunics and caps with small shards of glass. And woe to him who would be found with them at the next inspection. Three days in the punishment cell were assured to him. The punishment cell was about 30 steps up, under the roof, and it did not look very inviting. When I failed to eliminate the remnants of lice in three days, mainly in the woolen scarf my mother had knitted for me, and in my underwear, I decided to hide them. As a hiding place, I used the curtains, which served as a blackout and were lowered every evening. I was always one of the first to get up in the morning, and while others were still stretching from sleep, my scarf and underwear would fly up with the curtains rolled up in a tube. This method often proved itself brilliantly later on. In general, a lot of things could be smuggled in and hidden because the rooms were not very carefully controlled. My penknife I also concealed. It was given to me at the positions near the Don, near Logovsky, by the staff treasurer, who brought with him from his vacation a box with a set of such tools. It was an excellent knife, 
without the slightest trace of rust or dirt. I hid it in my leather coat. No one could have guessed that there was a narrow slit in the triple-stitched hem where I had stuck the paint knife. Of course, it had to undergo all the disinfections there, and it got more and more rusty. But it remained intact and provided a very valuable service for years to come. I did the same with the nail file that Gunther van Hooven gave me. However, it was only six months later. I put it in the lining of my epaulets, and that's how it got all the way to our house. One of the last letters to my mother I sewed into the lining of my raincoat hood. There was already an anti-fascist activity in the camp. As we later learned, back in December 1941, 158 German soldiers appealed to the German people to overthrow Hitler, to put an end to the war, and create a free Germany among free peoples through peaceful labour. The officers who joined the anti-fascist committee were Captain Doctor, Heidemann, Oberleutnant Horatius and Oberleutnant Riker. But at that time we did not know about it yet. We Stalingrad officers at first bent the Antifa, to cooperate with the enemy during the war, to agitate against our comrades. Seemed to us an unparalleled violation of our military oath, not in comparison with what we did when we decided to capitulate in defiance of Hitler's order to hold out to the end. Antifa in our eyes was treason against our people. And even the officers, though junior officers, not staff officers, went for it. We surrounded them with a wall of icy silence. The swear word Kashists appeared, an insulting nickname that hinted that they had joined the Antifa people, the anti-fascists, for the sake of material benefits. What particularly angered us was that they talked about cooperating with everyone, including communists. Communists. But after all, each of us after 1918 contributed to the struggle against the left to a greater or lesser extent. How many barriers created by tradition and outdated conventions had to be destroyed until we too, the officers of Stalingrad, understood what the honour of Germany and the future of Germany obliged us to. In our immediate neighbourhood were Daniels, Schlömer and other generals, as well as the highest Romanian and Italian officers. All of them were given maid servants who cleaned the uniforms and boots of their superiors at the door early in the morning. The rare conversations which we attempted in passing when we met the generals were of little substance. Daniels was almost always gloomy, Roski was arrogant and haughty, Liza was invariably silent, Schlomer still walked leaning on a stick. Since, apart from light athletic exercises, we were carefully protected from all physical labour and exertion, we in good weather for hours hanging around the camp yard. Large and small groups formed on the walk, among them there were also generals. The first reports and conversations took place. We were invited to watch Soviet movies. True, we could only get an idea of them on the basis of visual impressions. The introductory speech in German was usually too brief and superficial. But it was these movies that prompted many of us to study Russian seriously. I began to study it too. Then there were rumours that German communists had appeared in the camp. We, who belonged to the older generation, still had some idea of the doctor and writer Friedrich Wolff. Some of us had seen or heard about the play Sailors from Kataro many years ago. We were very much interested in the personality of Ludwig Wren. The former aristocrat became a communist. Strange. The conversations after the reports and movie screenings dealt mainly with political problems to our extreme displeasure, because some of us and there were most of us did not want to know anything about it. Others talked about these topics only in the narrowest circle, with people who enjoyed their trust. To counterbalance the administration's measures, an intensified and secret counter-propaganda began in our officers' environment. We, they said, should behave carefully, keep our ears open. We cannot know what will happen to anyone who dares to express his disagreement with the views of the anti-fascists. There are enough other topics for conversation to kill time somehow history, geography, literature, art, architecture. It's all interesting and quite harmless. I, too, succumbed to it and wrote down in my first homemade notebooks abstracts for papers on such topics. But despite everything, 
My first meetings with Friedrich Wolff and Gustav von Wangenheim left a mark on me it was impossible not to react to their ideas. I reflected on what I had heard and read the books in the library. When it began to thaw, I and other comrades began to spend many hours behind the barracks. We were allowed to saw wood in the yard. Later we were busy digging up the beds in front of the barracks, clearing the roads, paving the sidewalk with bored stones, then we bleached the stones with lime. At the beginning of April the command suddenly sounded prepare to march the camp began to bustle, and suddenly it became clear the past weeks were not spent on what was necessary, much more would have to be done for others, for comrades. And with whom will fate separate us? And who knows when we will see each other again? The fact that we were to part again was heavy on my heart. After all, when we decided to surrender, many of us became close to each other, it gave strength and confidence. But here in Krasnogorsk, where the days stretched so slowly and monotonously, there was a mutual distrust this distrust reigned already in the dead house near Stalingrad, when we, losing precious time, probed people to determine who among them is ready to support the proposal to surrender. From the very first days of our life in the former cobbler's shop, scandals began, sometimes over a piece of bread or the fact that a neighbour snores, sometimes over words spoken in the presence of comrades to a Soviet officer. But what a joy it was when, having filled out Red Crescent cards, we sent word of ourselves to our families. What a relief we felt when we became aware of the message broadcast by Moscow radio stations that we were still alive, we whom Hitler had declared dead in the ranks of the Sixth Army. This joy, this feeling of certainty, some people tried in every possible way to overshadow it. Who knows, they told us, whether our postcards from the camp had been sent? Who among us had heard the Moscow radio programme? How difficult it was to keep at least partially the uncertain, true, but still somewhat optimistic mood of the first days of the surrender. And how difficult it has become now to find anyone with whom you could frankly discuss everything that worries you Hitler's betrayal of the Sixth Army, what was the cause of the catastrophe? Was it only the mediocrity of the sergeant or only the lack of civilian courage of the army commanders who were unable to confront this ignoramus in military affairs? Or are there deeper reasons? Might they lie in the system itself, in the aims of the war? And it seemed that everything on which we had built our lives on which we had based the existence of our sons, was about to crumble to dust. Why did we keep silent, even though we knew so much about the fate of our Jewish friends, about the Warsaw Ghetto, about the order to kill commissars, about the brutal massacres of the civilian population? Why? You had to learn to guess with whom you could talk about these things without the risk of being immediately labelled an untrustworthy person who had to be kept in line. It was easy to recognise that you were going to be manipulated in such a way to take you in bonds too often we ourselves had done it on young lieutenants and soldiers. While in the cauldron, during the rush to the bridge across the Don, and at the positions near Dmitrievka. Suzdol. In about ten hours the train brought us to the place again some little station. What was waiting for us there? This is what none of us had the slightest idea about. Some time later, after a short walk, we found ourselves on the outskirts of a very long village, very typical for this area, and stopped in front of the walls of a huge fortress like Kremlin. It was then that we first heard the name of the city Sazdal. No one could suppose that our stay here would be decisive for many of us and would determine our future life path. We were accommodated in low, vast buildings stretching along the fortress walls, at least a metre thick, with embrasures and watchtowers. From endless corridors with windows under the ceiling, overlooking the courtyard, led doors to small rooms. Colonel Schwartz, Weber and von Gunstein and I were assigned the very last room in this long corridor. In each room there was a small window with a deep opening, barred with iron bars. It overlooked a courtyard, evidently internal, which was also separated from the outside world by a wall. Four beds with straw mattresses, a small table under the window, a shod wooden chair, and a few stools made up the furnishings of our dwelling. However, all four of us were content to be placed at the very end of the corridor. 
Here at least we would not be disturbed in our sleep, we thought. After all, the hundreds of residents of this block would have to go to the washrooms and toilets, run several times a day down the main corridor to roll call, or to the courtyard, where the kitchen was and where, in good weather, we dined outdoors. Apparently this part of the Kremlin had long been used as a barracks or as a prison. On the grounds beyond the wall were the churches we were captivated by their characteristically Russian gilded bulbous domes. As we soon learned, Sazdal was in olden times the residence of the highest clergy and princes, and several hundred years ago served as a fortress in a defensive war against the Tatars. The watchtowers, on which the sentries stood, were higher than the walls of the Kremlin, with the exception of a small wooden tower attached directly to the wall later we learned that Field Marshal Paulus and some German generals were placed there. In the inner courtyard, surrounded by walls, there were several wings, including one for the administrative staff, there was also the main building with a large camp library and several halls. In the second floor, there was a large and high its vault went under the roof front hall. A wide staircase led there. To this complex adjoined long buildings, erected on an older foundation and existed. Probably, for about one and a half hundred years, they housed an outpatient clinic and a small hospital. Italian and Romanian officers were settled in the northern part of the Kremlin. At first we had no communication with this territory. Every morning and every evening we were assembled in the middle of a large square outside the Kremlin. The German colonel on duty would report through him the orders and instructions of the Soviet camp administration were transmitted. In this way there was a semblance of self-government. We also had to deal with minor violations of the camp routine ourselves. Our health was still in a precarious state, so we, as in Krasnogorsk, received so-called hospital food, more caloric than the usual food in those days. On top of our duties to maintain order in the camp, we were now at the request of the administration daily engaged in sports, and within certain limits physical labour we worked in the garden, repaired roads, chopped wood, washed windows. Here, as in Krasnogorsk, there was a library. If we wanted to add to our knowledge, we were given all possible support. We enjoyed unlimited freedom in this respect. All kinds of manual labour were also encouraged. To begin with, we decided to whitewash the rooms and corridors and, where possible, to colour them by adding paint to the chalk. We got crushed bricks, lime and clay the colour of okra. I myself made up a whole palette of shades of coloured lime and began to make sketches of the ornaments with which we intended to decorate the walls between and above the doors. The architecture of the Kremlin allowed us to take silhouettes of German cities as a motif for painting door trims. Besides, we wanted to label each room not with a number, but with the name of a German city. In the meantime, a friend of ours, Adam, a conductor of the Cologne radio station, organised a men's choir, which was a universal success. Soon we were able to buy paper and notebooks. If we wanted to, we could start writing memoirs. The cigarette wrappers we received every two days were also good for notes. In fact, even then we should have written down much more, especially because very soon in Seussdal we had the opportunity to talk to German emigrants who wanted to get in touch with us and were always ready to acquaint us with many social and political problems, as well as with the problems of the development of the Soviet Union. When Wilhelm Pieck, a German Reichstag deputy from the Communist Party, once visited the camp, we all took it as an important event. However, we discussed meetings and reports only in our own circle. No one wanted to openly express his thoughts at meetings, first because he was afraid of displeasing his comrades, and secondly, because even here the rule was to be careful. We were supposedly under constant surveillance, so who knows what would happen to anyone who wanted to argue with the anti-fascists, it was a persecution mania that could neither be overcome by reasonable arguments nor curbed. Distrust is alien to me personally, so I did not take these warnings seriously, nor did I feel obliged to observe the special restraint that others felt was so necessary. However, this is what led to the most unpleasant clashes with my comrades in Susdal, and it began after the second roll call. 
At the assembly I stood, according to my height, fifth or sixth in the front row. To my left stood Captain Doctor. Haderman, who had joined the anti-fascist committee as early as 1941. Some colonels had therefore signalled to shun Haderman in every possible way it was forbidden to enter into any conversation with him, he was to be in total isolation. I considered this sentence of the secret tribunal unworthy. I tried to find out what kind of a man this universally despised doctor. Haderman, was we exchanged glances, explained ourselves by facial expressions, talked on occasion, sometimes exchanged a word of course. These conversations were brief and of little substance. Probably my attempts to establish a conspiratorial connection with him were rather clumsy. It was not until several months later that we finally sat at the same table with him and engaged in common business. On the 1st of May, the camp administration gave us the opportunity to organise an exhibition of our works. On tables, benches and walls, everything we had drawn, made and carved from wood was displayed, along with our other products. To our particular delight, Field Marshal Paulus and some generals took an interest in the exhibition. On this day, May 1st, 1943, General Daniels gave me a shabby cardboard box containing 12 small coloured pencils. The dilapidated label bore almost invisible to the eye the name of the Regensburg Pencil Factory and the date 1908. Daniels thought that these pencils would be in better condition. I used them extremely sparingly. They were with me for several years in a row until I returned to Berlin. With these pencils I made the few coloured sketches a reflection of the past that I managed to bring home. As in Krasnogorsk, I took it upon myself to organise a series of lectures on art history and military scientific questions. Later, however, I gave talks on such topics as German youth between the two wars 1918 to 1919, impressions and memories. The choice of these topics was predetermined by conversations with Johannes R. Becker, whose poetic work had a special charm for me. Meeting Johannes R. Becher. Becher always gave the impression of a very reserved person. Several times I saw him in the garden he was sitting alone, reading or thinking deeply about something, at least it seemed so. Perhaps he was thinking about the officers working in the flower beds, because he seemed to be looking at them very carefully. And then, quite unexpectedly, I was informed Becher had heard that I, like him, was from Munich, and you would like to talk to me. On learning that I intended to accept this invitation, Colonel von Hanstein, one of my roommates, came down upon me with reproaches and tried to make me take back my consent to meet Becher. You'll be killed there. One way or another, they won't let you come back to us at all. You can't know what the communists are up to. These attacks, however, did not shake my decision, and I was very much tempted by the forthcoming meeting with Becker, about whom I had already heard and read a great deal, and yet, I must frankly confess, I did not go to this first meeting with him with a light heart and not without prejudice. I was afraid that Becker might not bring me face to face with such problems as might threaten me with a serious inner breakdown. I was informed that the meeting with Becker would take place in one of the administrative buildings built inside the stone fence of the Susdal Kremlin. A junior officer of the camp guard waited for me on the wide staircase and led me to the second floor through corridors with wide floorboards sparkling clean. The nearby infirmary smelled of carbolic. When we reached the heavy oak door at the end of the corridor, the officer gave a short order to the sentry who accompanied me, then, knocking on the door and opening it carefully, addressed me very kindly. Please come in, mister. Becker will speak to you here. Johannes R. Becker stood up from a small table and asked, So you are then Colonel Steidel from Munich. Then he came up to me. Please, shall we sit down? Here are cigarettes. I was very glad to find my fellow countrymen among the Stalingrad officers. I sat down against him. There were windows on the right and left, the sun was shining on the courtyard, 
but in the room itself there was a chill the plastered walls were bare, there were few chairs, one simple cupboard. Deep window recesses gave away the thickness of the walls. I tried hastily, at a glance, to get an idea of Becker. So this is what intellectuals who become revolutionaries look like, I thought. We had often talked about what an intellectual was during the last few weeks, and the occasion was given by the works of Hein, Becker and Weinert. Those of us who were older remembered the events after 1918, and the concept of intellectual, in their interpretation took on a negative connotation, became synonymous with a person devoid of national feeling the word conjured up vague notions of anti-German pacifism and internationalism, of treason against the fatherland. But when Becker, looking at me over his glasses, began to speak thoughtfully and leisurely about Schwabing, I decided that there was something very birderish in his appearance. Where did you finish school? Munich. Are your parents still alive? Word by word we got to talking. So our fathers, both yours and mine, were lawyers. We talked about Leopold Strassi, Martius Strassi, Hohenzollern Strassi. During the First World War, our families lived next door to each other. It was there, in Schwabing, that we spent our youth, mine and Betcher's. Betcher obviously thought I was older than I really was, because I could hardly answer his questions about the artistic bohemian cabarets of the time. I was a schoolboy then, so of course I had an idea of the Simplicissimo and Café Stephanie, but I knew it all only superficially and from the posters. What, in fact, was this conversation leading up to? Becker didn't seem to consider the setting in which we met at all. But the reality was that I was a prisoner of war and he was a free man and that he was talking at ease. Nothing was weighing on him, while I was sitting against him with contradictory feelings. No matter how much I wanted to treat what was going on without any prejudice, I still had a feeling of inner protest and the consciousness that behind my back, on the other side of the door, stood a sentry with a machine gun. Thus what Bicker was saying sometimes escaped my attention, and then some poem of his would come to my mind again. What spiritual shifts were taking place in the mind of this poet, who, along with his other works, which have only now become available to us thanks to the camp library, but for some of us are completely unacceptable, wrote poems that spoke of such a blood bond with the homeland, such simple and truthful poems. It was hard for me to understand how his political views and revolutionary aspirations could be combined with his love for Germany, which he recreated so sincerely and authentically. But in that hour many things were said that lifted me above the camp existence with its unnecessary and, unfortunately, very superficial gossip among many comrades. I was especially attracted to this man by the aesthetic pleasure that his rich and imaginative speech gave me. During this conversation I sometimes felt as if I had been expelled from the surrounding reality, and only listened to him, and whether I wanted to or not listened to myself. I involuntarily turned away from him, then stood up, but he kept talking about the youth movement, about the Infantry Guards Regiment, about the Munich Water Sports Federation. I went to the window, looked at the dark red brick walls behind the vegetable garden, saw the plain stretching away into the distance, girdled by the blue-black ribbon of forests. Today, when I try to reconstruct this in my memory, I can say with a clear conscience that in my conversation with Becker I did not conceal my inner disagreement with him and my loyalty to the caste spirit that still existed in me at that time. To many questions I answered only that's right. My face must have reflected very clearly my negative reaction to some of Becker's challenging questions. I probably owe this to the nickname Chump which he gave me once, at a later date. Later, however, he wrote something else now I can already call a Chump my friend. Becher knew how to be wryly businesslike. Some of his questions were dumbfounding in their brevity. They got to the heart of things. What could one answer him when he asked? What is this German general thinking about? Or, what were you thinking when you invaded the Soviet Union? Or, why are those Stalingrad officers so reserved? And yet in that hour it was the first German for me 
since Stalingrad who had tried to penetrate to the very root of my way of thinking. My gut told me that he knew a great deal, that in him spoke an immense longing for his German homeland, that he was trying to reveal to me what a disappointment and even grief all the monstrous things that had brought Nazism to life were to him. This was obviously out of a need to find a way to reach another person who was not only shutting himself in, opposing this endeavour of his, but perhaps even secretly feeling the same way himself. There was a wholesome silence in that unassuming room, which for a few moments made me forget that I was in Susdol. Even now I can still see myself as I was I was at that hour, I can see myself pacing back and forth in that room from window to window. The slender façade of the cathedral, with its dome and bulbous turrets and very sparing old Russian ornamentation, loomed before my eyes. Each of us officers needed such a moment when we could come to our senses after Stalingrad to gather our thoughts, to find clarity in ourselves, to do away with what was left behind in the past, to determine our position in this new state for us. But when was there ever such a moment? After all, living together with our fellow prisoners almost never left us the opportunity to be alone with ourselves. Betcher must have realised this at the time. He knew how to be silent when necessary, how to be patient, and when he spoke of Bavarian peculiarities probably, in order to facilitate this deeply serious conversation it turned out that he had humour, that he could be almost cheerful I also noticed that he had no intention of insulting me, although his words were often harsh and merciless. Nevertheless, one thing he had accomplished the whole torrent of arguments directed against me henceforth gave me no rest. We were together for more than two hours. We had lost all sense of time. He went back to where he had started to the Stalingrad officers, to our joint responsibility, to the atrocities committed by the German troops in the countries they had invaded. He spoke again of Hitler and of the incomprehensible commitment of the German officer to a system that inevitably entails only the destruction of German culture, of the German homeland, the feralization and degeneration of the German spirit. And I could not but recognize his rightness, but I kept silent at that hour. Becker stood up and looked out of the window at the park, through which the Stalingrad officers walked back and forth singly in pairs, in groups. The shadows grew narrower and longer, it was the last break in the working day before the evening meal. It's time for you to leave, isn't it? Your comrades will be waiting for you. Dinner's coming up. And turning to me, he added, But we'll see each other again, won't we? Maybe down there on the bench? Do you have any requests? I didn't even ask how you were feeling, did I? Then he said slowly and meaningfully, So, mister, Colonel Steidel from Munich, and he extended his hand to me. A few days later we met him again, sitting together on a bench in the courtyard of the Susdal Kremlin, tree-lined and resembling a park. This time Becker kept aloof, looking at me furtively. And yet soon a dialogue between us took place. Its main topic was the latest report from the Theatre of War. German divisions were again exhausted, defeated, destroyed in the cauldron at Kursk. Becker gave vent to his burning hatred of Hitler's Germany, the culprit of all this but in his words sounded and deep compassion for people in trouble, misguided and deceived. He spoke passionately, excitedly, but at times his voice was again full of harsh condemnation. Becker had already foreseen what has become a living reality for us today. Already then he fought for a humanist Germany, which was part of the socialist commonwealth of peoples and nations, and therefore part of a world that we, the Stalingrad officers, could not have imagined at that time. That is why, at our first meeting with Becker, I was not able to understand much and very essential in my interlocutor. But I sensed in his words a mighty force of conviction. It was only later that I understood what the international solidarity of the proletariat meant and why Becker, even during the war, spoke with such confidence about a new society in which the peaceful future of our people was assured, to his attitude to people and to the world, to his special gift for analysing and grasping the essence of political and military events, 
I owe the criteria of truth that later played a decisive role in my life. Professor Arnold. A small, stubby man came out from behind the desk and observing the rules of politeness, offered to sit down. The room was in semi-darkness. The only window was obscured by the thick crowns of old trees, impenetrable to light. I felt uneasy. The unpleasant feeling was intensified by the uncomfortable and sparsely furnished room. Putting his elbows on the desk and scribbling on the paper with a stub of pencil, Professor Arnold began to talk. Of course he had quite accurate information about me. He asked no preliminary questions. We talked as if we were resuming a conversation we had started long ago. It's good that you've met Betcher, he said. We've been working with him for a long time. You will meet your fellow countrymen here. There were many revolutionaries in Bavaria. I think Betcher said you were from Swabia. Have you ever heard of Hernell? You used to farm, didn't you? I had to confess that I had no idea who Journal was. Then we talked about Munich, beautiful city, lots of art, lively cultural life. There are many such cities in Germany. After all, in one of his lectures he spoke at length about the fate of these cities, how they were destroyed. And in this case the German officers remained silent. Why do they keep so reticent, so stingy with words? What do I think about it? I told him frankly that he was too simple-minded. Who he is we don't know. He's a blank sheet of paper, so to speak. It's noticeable that he's been to many countries. He is well acquainted with German literature and knows very well the history of the First World War. We talked about this in the comradeship circle. But we also talked about this among ourselves because he is undoubtedly a communist, and with communists none of us is inclined to go into detailed explanations. He was silent for a moment. Then he said, I do not, you see, regard German officers as either ill-informed or ill-educated people, but I do think that many of them don't want to make ends meet. I shrugged my shoulders perplexedly. Then he spoke matter-of-factly, unabashedly. Apparently he scrutinised our personnel files, familiarised himself with the data on our civilian occupations. And he emphasised again that the officers, of course, were well informed about everything that was going on. He was extremely indignant that at his last report they had kept so hostile and withdrawn. The atmosphere was incandescent. He felt there was a wall between him and us. He spoke deliberately, harshly, to break our restraint. Is it necessary to be delicate with these officers of the general staff? They were not delicate in their treatment of Russians, both soldiers and civilians. I kept silent. Of course, he and I were separated by a wall, and we had deliberately created this wall. Of course, we were offended by the fact that he so openly and aggressively blamed us for the actions committed by the Germans, which, however, some of us had already thought about, and we discussed these actions in a close circle because such facts as the persecution of Jews, atrocities committed against the civilian population in occupied countries, are incompatible with the honour of a soldier, with tradition it is simply impossible. We listened to his report in icy silence then all of us, as one, noisily, deliberately tapping our boots, went down the main staircase to the first floor by this we protested against the way this Soviet professor had highlighted the facts, obviously believing that we too were personally responsible for them. And now the same problem again, the return of officers to active military service. Yes, that's right, we were not returning to some unknown army, but to the Wehrmacht we put our military knowledge and experience at Hitler's disposal, and we did it when it should have been clear to everyone where Hitler's political course was leading. Why? How can we now, in a few minutes, unravel this tangle of reasons? We returned to the army because, after all, it was necessary to provide for the livelihood of our families. Many were of the opinion that someone should be at his post. In order to preserve tradition in this new army, it was impossible to put everything at the disposal of Hitler, the stormtroopers and the SS gang. What, in fact, did we know then? And what did we learn only later? What exactly did we want to know and what did we try to ignore? How did I even understand in the past Hitler's political course? This formula, let's end the humiliation of Germany, 
let go of the shame of Versailles? And how did I explain the mass persecution of the Jews? As extremes, the consequences of which should be mitigated, but this, they said, was the struggle against the Commune. And now I was in the position of a prisoner of war, face to face with a man from the Commune. This Communist raised the question of our thinking in two plans explaining his point. He emphasised in 1934 to 1935, most officers voluntarily returned to active military service. In essence, his words were not unlike the warning my father had given me returning to active military service would put me in the same company as the SASS. Professor Arnold interrupted the silence. We are all well aware, he said, of the achievements of the German people, and we know that the Germans could have achieved much more. German culture, the great German classics are highly valued by their compatriots. Do I understand, Steidel, how shocked the Soviet people were by the actions of the German Wehrmacht? Do I not understand that the atrocities of the SS, the concentration camps, the inhuman orders and vile looting, the senseless burning of entire villages, the destruction of women and children, that these atrocities are in flagrant contradiction to everything that even now, even during the war, the Soviet people talk about with respect. The great cultural achievements of the Germans who enriched the culture of all mankind. Such was in the past the Germany of Goethe and Schiller, of Einstein and Planck, of Heigl, Marx and Engels. Prof. Arnold raised another point he had talked to some prisoners of war who claimed credit for being religious. What kind of religion is it, however, that tolerates a man who supposedly adheres to the doctrine of love of neighbour to act like a brutal mercenary invading a foreign country and killing people? Prof. Arnold said that he was surprised at the poor knowledge of the great revolutionary traditions of German history. Even among the officers of the general staff they had a very superficial idea, even of the revolutionary events of 1918 to 19, 1919, of which they were eyewitnesses. And when it comes to the peasant wars of 1525 or the liberation movement of 1812 to 1813, the revolution of 1848, in which Marx and Engels took an active part, or the revolutions of the 20th century, the officers always have the same reaction in discriminate condemnation. While condemning, they leave out similar events in world history, ignore reliable materials, primary sources, do not take into account the later historical development. He is simply astonished, said Prof. Arnold, by the appalling ignorance of all that concerns factual data every time accurate knowledge is substituted by the repetition of stampedes. I was puzzled by this characterization of German officers. We knew German history, but we had never seriously studied the events which Professor Arnold called the climaxes, the turning points of German history. In our opinion, it was easy to manage it all except to memorise the chronological date, and that was enough. We were never interested in the preconditions and consequences of the events. But now Professor Arnold has covered these very consequences of the events with full knowledge, thoroughly and in detail. Every turning point in German history has always been used against the interests of the people. In 1812 to 1813, in 1848, the people struggled selflessly for the independence and unity of Germany, but they were deceived, their aspirations were not realised. Moreover, each time the triumph of state reason for that is the usual terminology of the officers led to an expansion of the power of the state, to a policy of conquest, to new wars. New facts came upon me, I was confronted with a new way of thinking, with completely new criteria in assessing historical development, it was impossible to assimilate it all at once. However, the greatest impression was made on me by his words about the power of the ruling groups, about the unlimited abuse of power these considerations prompted me to familiarise myself with those informative books in the camp library, which I had deliberately neglected before. I began to look for new meetings with Professor Arnold. After all, the crime committed by Hitler over the Sixth Army was precisely that he had shamelessly abused his power he had demanded blind obedience from hundreds of thousands of men, demanded that they sacrifice their lives, yet he himself had shown neither loyalty nor a sense of responsibility, cynically neglecting his duty, 
which I considered natural, based on my idea of military honour. During the escape, at the crossing of the Don, at the edge of death, at the positions at Dmitrievka and Novoleksivka in Bekitovka, in Krasnogorsk and now in Suzdal, I have again and again puzzled over the question how did it come to Stalingrad? Is it not possible, based on the considerations expressed by Professor Arnold, to give a new, more correct answer to the questions that tormented me? Am I right to disregard his arguments only because the foundations of my own worldview, the usual views on historical development, will be shaken? Should I not, on the contrary, take his words seriously, consider his arguments, since they open new perspectives and can help to overcome the consequences of the current shameful events? I had before me the opportunity to start anew and, as I later realised in the National Committee for a Free Germany, to combine the traditions of a truly national way of thinking and acting with a new understanding and new ways of historical development. Toward new shores, my first conversation with Prof. Arnold ended when it became dark. In fact, the conversation never really ended, there were still many unresolved questions. I remembered everything I had experienced during both world wars I recalled conversations with my father and an old friend of our family, military judge Kraus, about military expediency, which had been invoked by the ruling circles during the First World War to cover various violations of international law. As I walked through the Kremlin to my room after my meeting with Professor Arnold, I was in a good mood again for the first time in a long time. What I had just experienced was by no means idle chatter to kill time. This Soviet scientist was having a conversation with me that awakened my thoughts, brought some relief, and promised to help me in the future. It had been a long time since anyone had paid such attention to me, spoken to me warmly, and yet patiently, thoughtfully listening and looking at me. He took seriously my doubts, my remarks, my mental conflicts, even my views which were erroneous, in the opinion of my interlocutor. My roommates, without getting into what I was saying, interrupted me, prevented me from bringing to a conclusion the thoughts I was trying to develop before them. They subjected this mysterious professor to devastating criticism. The evening hours before going to bed were spoiled by the insulting and angry outbursts or the icy silence of my neighbours. Later, during one of my conversations with Prof, Arnold, I endeavoured to prove to him by many small examples that Christian opposition against Hitler does exist it is difficult to notice for the uninitiated, but it is active against the Nazis. Professor Arnold was aware of the diverse nature of the intra-German resistance movement against fascism he emphasised that the struggle demanded sacrifices from all resistance fighters, Christians, communists, social democrats and liberals. Judging from the questions he asked, he was interested in as yet unknown details and interrelationships, which side of Hitler's policy had aroused opposition in Christian circles, the policy toward the church or the inhuman regime in the concentration camps, the persecution of the Jews, the war of conquest? What is the official position of the church, Catholic and Lutheran? How do ordinary people feel about all this? From the answers I could then give him, he certainly did not get accurate information. They helped me more than they helped him. They encouraged me to reflect, to think about my own attitude toward Nazism as a Christian. I noticed that in Professor Arnold's discourse certain turns of phrase were often repeated and that there was clearly an inner connection between them common people united front humanist, especially such terms as humanist and humanism. Acquired in his speech a different and broader meaning than I was accustomed to. At one time we were taught in gymnasium that humanism was a certain epoch in the history of spiritual culture. Belonging to the past later it was replaced, and even turned out to be more advanced by other currents. When Arnold used the epithet humanist, it always meant that he gave a positive assessment of someone's views, achievements, deeds, a humanist scientist, a humanist artist, the humanist forces of the German people, which must unite to resist fascism, must form a united front. Humanist was undoubtedly a quality for which he, a Marxist, had respect. Already during our invasion of the Soviet Union, many things struck me that could not be reconciled with the Goebbels' propaganda 
about Bolshevism's hostility to culture, for example, the village library had Heinz poems in German. In Germany, I would not have found books in foreign languages in a village bookstore. Already at the first conversation with Prof. Arnold, I was excited by the warmth with which he spoke of the achievements of the German people in science and art. I was struck by the names he mentioned when listing humanist writers Rainer Maria Rilke, Ricarda Hock, Thomas Mann, Lion Fuchtwenger, Oscar Maria Graf, all of whom were not communists at all. Such breadth and open-mindedness impressed me greatly. The Soviet scientist who could formulate his thoughts so sharply and sharply and give many things such a devastating assessment. I was more and more impressed by the reliability of information, the vividness of thought, the logic of inferences. Prejudiced, stubbornly defended opinions, generalities not supported by concrete knowledge, deafness and closed-mindedness, to everything that diverges from the usual ideas such features I noticed not in Professor Arnold, but in my comrades. At that time there were still relatively few officers among us who showed a genuine interest in conversations with Soviet people and German emigrants. Only a few among us were ready to grasp the new state of affairs, which required a new interpretation this was prompted by news from the front, by reading literature and, above all, by the frank and unvarnished coverage of problems in conversations. Only a few had the determination to realise the false path that the German people had followed, the path that had led them to the catastrophe on the Volga. Only a few among us stopped lulling ourselves with illusions and high-minded rants about German culture, about the greatness of German history, about great German figures in politics and science, Few tried to penetrate into the essence of the Soviet social order and study the Russian language. Major Engelbrecht, the son of an eye doctor in Erfurt, two captains from Austria and Captain Doctor. Hedeman, who was reviled among the officers, was so inclined. Who are the others? How to find contact with them? The walls of the Susdal Kremlin were in no way to prevent me from getting out of the ideological deadlock besides. I had now learned how Wilhelm Pieck felt about the great German traditions, about German writers and thinkers, about the whole German culture. And it was clear to each of us how much more deeply Professor Arnold understood the German situation than we all did. I came to the decision that it was necessary at last to explain myself frankly to Professor Arnold. I wanted to leave Susdal. He promised to find a way to help me. One evening we met again near the outpatient clinic he informed me of a plan for a joint trip he intended to travel with me, but asked me not to tell anyone about it. This took place in the middle of June. The next morning, immediately after the morning roll call, a Soviet lieutenant appeared and suggested that I pack my things. Please follow me. You will go on a journey, he said meaningfully in German, obviously repeating a learned turn of phrase. To the horror of my companions, I did indeed begin hastily packing the few belongings I had. The neighbours showered me with reproaches and warnings. Hanstein spoke to me rudely. The other two roommates were willing to take a conciliatory stance. But Hanstein had to fight back at once, he had to be cut off decisively. So I answered him more and more sharply and definitively. Then, panting with rage, he began to shout that I was crazy a scoundrel that I had idiotic ideas, and that the Russians would destroy me, having first squeezed and torn out of me everything they needed. With each word he came closer and closer to me, gesticulating threateningly. A scandal broke out. A rift between us was inevitable since he was the one who hatefully rejected anything that would mean the slightest rapprochement with the other party. My patience was wearing thin, most eagerly I would have hit him. Upstairs on my straw mattress I still had some loose change to put in my duffel bag. I jumped up on the mattress, thinking that this would end the argument. Weber and Schwartz had already realised that I could not be persuaded. They forced Hanstein to leave the room. It was quiet for a few minutes. I had to hurry. It was not difficult to pack, but we had much to say to our friend. Breathing heavily, all three of us tried to take advantage of the brief pause to collect our thoughts. 
Schwartz took a few puffs, smoking his self-twist. The room filled with puffs of smoke. Weber turned away to the window. Through the window I could see how the rays of the morning sun, which had risen over the wall, illuminated the sparse grass in our little patio. Suddenly the door swung open sharply. Standing on the threshold, the furious, crimson-haired Hanstein again attacked me. He did not hesitate in expressing himself. Such words as meanness and treason were said. I yelled something back at him, sitting up and ducking my head under the low ceiling. At that moment I was packing, along with my socks, shreds of trench coat, and political pamphlets, a crutch from a railroad track a few weeks before, digging through the vegetable garden. I had found this great tool, suitable for hammering nails, aligning pieces of wire or sheets of tin that we cut from old drain pipes and used as material when we made things. And at that moment I found nothing better to do than to throw the crutch at Gunstein. It was instantaneous. The crutch missed him, flew over Gunstein's shoulder, past his chin and into the wall on the other side of the wide hallway. Was it my lucky star or an accident? None of us wanted or could think about it at that moment. We all came to our senses at once. And here we stood side by side like schoolboys after a wild prank. Greetings to all comrades, to all of course a thousand thanks be well report to the duty officer. To Gunstein I also extended my hand. The corridors and walls echoed as I jogged toward the exit. I looked back quickly. Who will complete the paintings and silhouettes of the cities above the doors? When will you follow me? I looked back again, walls, towers, churches with Russian crosses, high walls at the refectory. Here, in the room behind the wooden balcony, I met Becker. A young Soviet officer approached me. Please, the professor is there. He's already waiting. So I left Suzdal. There was a car in front of the Kremlin gates. Anna, this is Colonel Steidel from Munich. I involuntarily fixed my cap, feeling that I looked miserable and pathetic next to this woman, who held herself with such dignity and even majesty. Later, of course, you'll get to know him better. So, let's go. Now many of your wishes will be realised. Colonel Steidel will see Moscow. Anna Porker sat next to the driver, the two of us in the back. For the first two hours, only occasionally a question broke the silence. All four of us were immersed in our own thoughts, looking for answers to the questions we were asking ourselves. Our driver, a Russian senior lieutenant or captain, doubtless knew that behind him sat a German officer, probably a staff officer, a prisoner of war from Seasdal a German to whom his countrymen had extended their hand. I had to answer to him, too, how many sufferings, how much grief I had to experience, how many dead I had to mourn for his family and his native land because of the Germans. For the first time I was again able to travel through a country new to me without fear and not under compulsion, although the future was unknown to admire this country, which, like ours, was blooming in the late spring under a high cloudless sky, illuminated by the sun. I will not forget the halt between the field and the grove under its rustling foliage. Anna Porker had taken care of everything. She spread a large linen tablecloth on the ground, took out from a basket wrapped in paper good portions of bread, sausage, lard and butter, and placed mugs of tea in front of us. The conversation touched on the most mundane topics. It was about worn-out shoes, about Anna Porker's burned-out cloak, about the paper from which the driver had rolled up his flavouring. Professor Arnold said something, by the way, about his stay in a French town. That, in fact, was all we talked about. But it was a momentous hour for the first time the prospect of ordinary life opened up, and it made it possible to think that peace would one day come. Not far from us, at a distance of a few hundred metres, stretched ditches across a swampy, marshy meadow in a mire of stagnant water they had not been cleaned for years. Wherever the war had left its traces. How gladly I would have thrown off my tunic and gone there with a pick and shovel to clear the water drain.